Well, good morning, everyone. Hope everybody had a great week. I feel 100% better than I did last week when I was given this message. So um, I'm excited at least about that part of it. I'm excited about how well I feel today. Um, but I want to tell you one thing before we get started. Um, kind of a reminder from the Lord, kind of a reminder um, from us as His children is that the Lord says that He loves us. I know you're kind of going to go like, duh, Mark, yes, he loves us. No, I'm saying he loves us. He loves you. Like he loves you. He loves you even if you don't want to do anything else the rest of your life except just um, not change, not move, not do anything else. He still loves you. There's an unconditional love that goes way beyond our actions. It goes beyond our failures. It goes beyond our our shame. It goes beyond everything that we have in our life. There's a love. There's a deep abiding love. Last week when we were in um, groups and we were breaking up, I was listening. Um, I had a picture um, in my group. We were talking. I had a picture from the Lord, I believe. And the picture was is that if you can imagine the Lord every morning um, setting the table for you for breakfast. And so when you wake up in the morning, you, you start smelling in the air. You smell um, maybe if you like bacon, you smell bacon cooking, you smell pancakes, you smell waffles, you smell eggs. Like you smell this amazing breakfast. If you like coffee, you smell the, the best brewed coffee. You begin to, the aroma begins to fill um, your bedroom as you wake up and you come downstairs. You're invited to sit at the table and a meal is served for you. And um, that's the invitation we have every day with the Lord. And he doesn't even, and it's okay if you wake up one morning and go like, I don't have time for you right now, Lord. Um, the same meal is still at the same table. The same seat is still set at the same place. Um, when you have time for him, you come and you sit and you place yourself there. That's the acceptance, I believe, the picture was showing me of the Lord. The Lord says, I'm here for you. I have your meal prepared um, and I'm open to listen and talk anytime. You're always welcome at my table and there's always a seat for you. Um, so today, just remember that you're loved greatly, you're loved dearly, and that there's nothing that you can do. If you go to Romans chapter 8, get in the very latter part of 8, there's nothing that you can do to separate yourself from the love of God. So just remember that. Okay, today <clears throat> we're in week 3 um, of our little mini-series, I guess, talking about growth. Um, you know, the first week I talked about um, that this growth, this Christian walk, this growth with the Lord as we go through time is it's a long race. Um, so it's not short. It's not a sprint. It's a long, continual race. And that your race is not my race, even though there will be some similarities. There's not. Our races are different. So that, so that was kind of the first week. Last week I talked about things that inhibit our growth, you know, and we were around unbelief and toxic thoughts, that we have to take our thoughts captive. We literally have to take our thoughts and put them in jail and put the key and lock them up and say you can't ever come out. There's no parole for you, no parole for that thought. And so part of that process was that we were trying to move things out of our way that inhibited our growth. So this week, we're going to talk about what helps our growth, like what things need to be present, kind of what ingredients or differing things need to be present in the process of growth. Because you know, when a plant's growing, you know, key part about a plant when it grows is it's in seed form. And so just to kind of encourage everyone, if you've started walking with Jesus just today, like if you walked into the room and you haven't told anybody yet, but you said, I accepted Jesus this weekend and like I, I just started my relationship with him. You have everything you need in that initial place. That initial seed has everything it needs to grow up in the kingdom. Just like an acorn has every bit of a hundred-year-old oak tree, all the DNA and everything it needs to grow is in that acorn. And all it takes is time for it to grow. <clears throat> so part of my encouragement this morning as we talk about how things grow is that from the plant process, Everything begins in seed form, but it does grow up into something and it takes time. And it's time and a process, but there are different things that come into growth. So it starts in seed form. It breaks out into um, the sunlight out of the soil. It breaks out. It begins to grow and put leaves on. It begins to, you know, if it's a tree, it begins to put bark on. It begins to fruit. 
and it continues to grow and grow and grow it. And trees and plants only grow when they're planted somewhere. They only grow when they're planted. And so I'm going to get back, I'm going to touch on that towards the end. So today, <clears throat> turn to Acts chapter 2. My favorite passage. This could be one of my favorite passages in Scripture um, that I really like to just continue to dig into because it's how I've experienced the majority of my growth. and It's, how I've, it's been the chemistry of the growth that I've experienced in my personal life. Um, and so we're going to unpack this for a little bit and see what actually is going on here. So Acts chapter 2 will be in verses 42 through 47. Um, and I'll be in the Passion Translation. I'll be crossing back over between that and actually the New King James Version as well. Okay, <clears throat> so Acts chapter 2. Um, we're finding here, this is, um, Peter has just preached this amazing sermon. The Spirit has just um, fallen on the upper room. If you go out to the very beginning of Acts chapter 1, Jesus in Acts, um, um, in Acts chapter 1 um, was ascended to heaven, talking to his disciples, and then he ascends to heaven. Two, the Spirit's given, and so we're at the end of two now. And so the Spirit's been given, and the church is being birthed. And so as the church is birthed, this is the beginning things um, that begin to happen. So let's read these verses here, and we're going to pick out the characteristics around what it means to grow, um, to have growth. So here we go. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And I'm going to read the whole passage, and then I'll go back and I'll start picking it apart. So, um, verse 42. Every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers were in fellowship as one body, and they shared with one another whatever they had. Out of generosity, they even sold their assets to distribute the proceeds to those who were in need among them. Daily, they met together in the temple courts and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. They were continually filled with praises to God, enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were being or who were coming to life. <clears throat> so through this passage, there's a quite a few little um, elements that kind of play into our overall growth as a body, but also as believers. Um, so the first part here, let's start breaking it apart. The first part is verse 42. There's a couple of components. There's going to be four components in 42 that just have to be part. If you're going to grow as somebody who professes Jesus as their Savior, and you say, Jesus um, has saved me. He's cleansed me and washed me from my sins. He's made me new in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, any man's in Christ is a new creation. If you're proclaiming that and saying, that's what's happened to me, then these are going to be some ingredients that have to be a part of your your daily walk, your weekly walk, your monthly walk, your annual walk. It has to be a part of what's going on in your life. So um, it says here, 42, every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly in prayer. So first of all, number one, it says they were devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. So number one, so they were devoted to following teachings. The teachings meaning the scriptures. They were devoted to following the scriptures. Um, in this day, there would have been just the Old Testament. Uh, would have been the Old Testament. Um, they wouldn't have had the New Testament penned yet. Um, so they would be following those writings in the Old Testament and the application of the testimony um, of the new. Uh, the gospel that Jesus brought. So what Jesus brought, you know, as the disciples began to witness it, as they began to witness Him healing people, as He began to flip things on their head by saying, 
No, your sins are forgiven. So the fact that he began to forgive sins and said that I'm the Messiah, I'm the one who forgives sins. So they began to teach and to walk and grow the church out of the fact, the simple fact that there was a promised Messiah and that he came and that when he came, he did miraculous signs and wonders and they, their sins were forgiven And they were to be together and walk in this. And this is what they're teaching. And this is what they're talking about. So as we're going forth here, he says, so you have to be um, devoted or around the apostles' teaching. So you have to be around the scriptures. So there's no way. I'm going to tell you there's virtually almost no way. I almost can say 100%. You can say, well, Mark, what happens to somebody in the jungle or somewhere else? Listen, the the Spirit of the Lord has the ability to teach and preach and reveal things in nature and reveal things, the gospel to us when even the words are not present. But we all have words now, and we also have um, our, these phones, these devices we use. And so we have access to the Word, so we should read the Word because Jesus is the Word. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, John 1.1. 1, 1. So Jesus is the Word, and so we're reading um, his word. So there's no um, shortcut to reading the word. So a daily diet would be, I just, I, I just need to be consuming the word. I need to be consuming um, something on a daily diet. Um, okay, so the apostles' teaching or the, the apostles' doctrine or the teachings of, of the disciples. That's the first one. The second one um, is simply fellowship and here in this pass in the passion translation says the hearts were mutually linked to one another sharing communion with one another so there's a fellowship their hearts were mutually linked to one another now that's a high calling i guess for believers says these believers had their hearts linked together and so as i was pondering this week on like what does it mean to have my heart linked to another heart it means that in my daily thought process, somewhere in the week, I'm thinking about you. And as I think about you, I'm praying about you. I'm pressing into the Lord about you. So it means that if, like for my group on Sunday, I can tell you who was in my group on Sunday. And Sunday we prayed, Sunday in my little group, we had um, Zach, Arnold, um, Damian Hancock, and... My youngest son, Stone. So we were all four in a group. We were standing in the kitchen. I was right in the corner. Stone was to my right. Damien was straight ahead. And then Zach was kind of like right there. I remember that because it's, it's significant to me. It's an important time because I'm united with them. And so when I come in their presence, I can think back about, okay, who are they? What are they doing? How do I need to pray for them? Because our hearts are united. So there's part of this fellowship that happens in, in the New King James, it's calling this fellowship. When you have our hearts united together, there's part of this fellowship that happens because we are gathered one to another in a location and a place. So part of this, if you're going to grow in the Lord, it's going to have to be, you're going to have to be continually devoted to gathering together with one another because that's going to be how things um, grow. You're not, I don't think we as a body of believers are going to be, have the ability to grow in Christ without being joined one to another. And I don't mean just by the name of the church we attend or by the fact that we say we're Christians. I'm saying because we understand what's going on in each other's lives, because we've been praying with one another and our hearts are united together. So this is part of the fellowship part. Now, also this says in the breaking of bread or sharing communion together. So another part of this is, <clears throat> is even today, um, I'm going to call our gather group leaders together to today. I'm just going to say, hey, gather group leaders right now. At the end of this, we're going to do communion. So I'm going to tell you just to grab some elements at the end of this. Grab crackers, bread. It doesn't matter if you use water, whatever you want to use um, to represent the body and the blood. And we're going to we'll have communion right now because we're, we're together and we're going to be together. So part of that is sharing communion together. But also part of it is sharing a literal meal together. 
And so in our gather groups, that's why we try. Like last week in, in the gather group I was in, we did breakfast in the morning. So we had breakfast early. Um, and so we came around breakfast and then we worshiped and came around the word. And then we actually went from there, you know, into, you know, prayer and then we left. And so part of this, these early believers were getting together and it says they got together and they shared communion together, but they also shared a meal together. And so it's important because in Jewish culture, if you understand Jewish culture, you would never, unless you were a friend of someone, you were never invited to sit down and have a meal with them. In other words, you wouldn't just have a meal with a stranger. In that culture, it was not um, culturally um, probably, um, it didn't happen very often that if you're going to share a meal, because meal, because food was actually was scarce, so it's not like oh we just go to the refrigerator and grab some food out, just grab that out. There was like no food was scarce, so if I'm sharing a meal with you, it meant that you meant something to me. And so part of that is why we share meals together weekly in our houses, is because it continues to demonstrate the importance of one to another, and that you know we have a relationship with one another, and this is part of building that relationship. So also from that, um, coming together regularly. But then, um, so we have, um, so the four things there in verse 42, or we're around the apostles' doctrine, just the teaching of the scriptures. We're around fellowship, right? Our hearts are joined together. We're around breaking bread. You know, we're around the part of breaking bread with um, not only communion, but also our regular meal and also around prayer. It's so important. Like this week, uh, <clears throat> I was praying for different people. Like this week, the Lord had me one day just sitting and I was praying just for um, missionaries. And so I was thinking through all the people that I know that are on the field and kind of going through them, just lifting them up to the Lord. The Lord just praying, blessing them, Lord. Father, let their resources come to them. Um, Lord, protect their family. Lord, encourage them right now in their spirit. Like let them be encouraged even as they're resting right now. Let their... Let them um, be encouraged in what they're doing. Give them vision for further moving the kingdom. So prayer. So those four things are just part of it. So let's, But listen, the word that ties all this together, the word that ties that one verse all together, if you read the very beginning of that, go back in the Passion Translation, it says, Every believer was faithfully devoted, faithfully devoted, They were faithfully devoted. To be devoted, I was looking it up in, in the Greek. Um, to be faithfully devoted to something was, you know, to actually to continue to do something without stopping, without ceasing. It said to continue all the time in a place. To be devoted to something is to continue all the time in a place. To continue. All the time. And so this devotion has to be a heart thing. It has to be something. It can't be um, something that you're guilted into. It can't be out of a wrong motive. This devotion has to be out of a pure place. A pure place of I'm looking at one another going like, yeah, we want to, we want to be together. And so it doesn't mean that our, our, do you miss a week? Do you miss two weeks? No, big. it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with the fact that you're not present. It has the fact that you want to be present when you're there and that you're choosing to be present. And that devotion, and it has really nothing to do with the fact of, um, you know, the larger corporate body. This ha the Lord says, if you want to grow, if you want to walk, if you want to experience things in me, this is how you do it. You devote yourself to the Scriptures. You devote yourself one to another in fellowship. You devote yourself to breaking bread and taking communion together. You devote yourselves to prayer. These are the things that are found. This is what was found in the New Testament, the early, early church. People are wants to be like the early church. Well, here you go. Here's the early church. <clears throat> Look at verse 43. What happened out of this? A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone. And the apostles performed many miracles and signs and wonders. Listen, we can't be together and be proclaiming the scriptures and, and how real these things are and praying together and breaking bread together and God not break out. 
the Holy Spirit and not break out into this fabulous thing, this thing of healing and, and breakthrough and encouragement and just relaxation and peace. It, it just because we're, these things are present and we continue in them, it's going to happen. It, there's no way for it not to happen. Maybe too often we come looking for a particular thing or a particular thing doesn't appear to have the taste that we want. It It doesn't whet our appetite. It doesn't move a thing. You know, it does help when we're coming on Sundays and we're walking with one another in life generally is to come hungry and to come with some desperation. Um, Come with some, some push in our heart going like, we don't want to be the same. We don't want to be complacent. We want to move and we want to grow. This is kind of part of what they're talking about here. Now, verse 44, this is all the believers were in fellowship as one body. It means there was a unity that was about them. And they shared with one another whatever they had. And simply, they heard things. They heard one another. They heard, oh, you need this, Here, I have this to share. Oh, you need that, I have this to share. And so they have ears open. They look how they can serve their community within their houses. And they, they listen even out from other believers and they listen to the community and they listen to where, okay, God, how do you want us to serve there? And so their ears were open. The biggest hindrance to being generous and honestly being devoted to something is all the distractions Distractions are never going away. You're, we're never going to overcome the fact that our world moves at a particular pace. And they're not going to go away even when we move to a place that's peaceful and quiet because the, we become the manager of the distractions. And so if we're there and everything's peaceful and everything, eventually the distractions will come back in. It'll, it'll, it, they'll find us because a lot of times it's... A, Distractions and things are attached to thought processes, and it goes back to the toxic toxic thoughts. Jesus has called us to to you know take all of our thoughts captive. Wednesday afternoon, I was as I was preparing for this message. <clears throat> you know, if you get in a particular location, if I'm at the church, somebody might want to talk to me. If I have my phone with me, somebody may want to talk to me on the phone. If I'm in a coffee shop, so you have this going on. And so it's like I had to take a block of time and I had to go like hide somewhere. And so, not that I'm trying to hide from people, but when, when I know I need to be focused and not distracted on something, I have to go somewhere sometimes and then it just cuts everything, just to cut everything off. Um, because my mind, when I get somewhere like that, is able to relax. I go, like, okay, I'm here. I'm able to have peace. And so um, when we're cutting these distractions out of our lives in order to be devoted one to another, um, we have to, we just have to know how to take, capture our thoughts. Okay, that was 40, 44 was they were generous with one another. This is out of generosity. They also sold their assets and distributed proceeds um, to all that had need. And so that would be like um, <clears throat> we had property or something and we were going after um, something new for the church or we knew somebody that needed a need and they had a need of a big thing. But we just sell assets and we just say, okay, here's, here's Lord, you let us do this here. We just sell and give it. And that's, and that's the way you do it. Verse 46. So daily they met together in the temple courts and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. It means daily they were in one another's lives. The temple court would have been, <clears throat> everything was in walking distance, and so they may be walking through the temple court outside the temple, and they may be stopped, and they met together, and they talked for 30 minutes, and they said, you know, how was your evening? Um, let's pray for this, and let's talk about this. I'll meet you here tomorrow at the same time. And so they were kind of doing it at the temple courts, and they were also, even in that, they were also meeting in each other's homes, and they would come in and say, hey, let's take a meal together. Let's celebrate communion together. Let's... And so their hearts and their, how they pushed and did things were all around that. So they shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. A very simple thing. Now look at 47. They continually filled, were filled with praises to God. 
So there's a worshipful thing that's happening in this group. And they were joined the favor of all the people. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were coming to life. Now, Jesus, as we operate, as we operate in the teaching of the Scriptures, as we operate in fellowshipping together one to another, where our hearts are put together, as we continue to devote ourselves to breaking the bread and taking communion together as prayers, we devote ourselves to each other, as we devote ourselves to our community around us. It says, as they did this, it said, they had favor with all people, but it says, they also, God was adding to them those who were coming to life, those who were being saved and born again, He was adding to them. And so, this is how I want to encourage us today. You want to know how to grow? This is how, this is how we grow. We come hungry. We come with a desperation to want to move into something. And then we go, okay, Lord, here I am. And then we devote ourselves to the scriptures and to the gathering and to the fellowship. And growth begins. Now, here's the challenge. <coughs> I think we want to grow like a stock would grow, a stock in the stock market. I think we want to invest something. <clears throat> hey, I've been investing for the last three weeks in something. I put my money there a year ago, and so I expect my money to look like this this year. And so as we expect this thing to happen so fast, we forget that the acorn and the oak tree, the acorn is planted and it takes you know, over a hundred years to produce something that's huge and majestic. And it has everything it needs in there, but we forget the process of growth. We forget the process of time. And I think that's why the word here is used as devoted, is that they devoted themselves one to another. At the end of the day, we have to stay planted somewhere and devote ourselves one to another, in order to experience the growth that our hearts desire. And our hearts desires that growth because our hearts, go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I think it's verse 12 and 13, it talks about the eternity has been placed in our hearts and that we cry out for this satisfaction and there's the only way to be satisfied is to be devoted one to another in the scriptures, in the fellowship, in the prayer, observing the Lord's Supper, being generous one to another, singing praises together. This is the, this is the brilliance of, of walking with the Lord. This is it. This is, this is how we grow as a body. This is how we grow as individuals. So today I want to encourage us um, be refreshed in this. Like, like this. Let this be an encouragement to what you're doing. And if part of this you need to grab onto, grab onto it and say, this, I need that part. Like, I need this. I need to refresh this part. And then to just begin in that part. So right now, gather group leaders, I'd like for everybody just to, um, I'd like us to take communion right, right now. Um, so for everybody to um, maybe break up in groups, recognize that, you know, the, the body is represented in, in the bread or the element, the cracker, whatever you're using, and the blood's represented in the juice or the water, whatever you're using there, and that one was, was, was sacrificed for the healing in our bodies, and the other one is sacrificed to, for, the, you know, for the sins and to make us right with the Father. And so there's a representation of, of His life bringing life to us as we partake of that. It's not a time to remember sin. It's not a time to remember our past. The Lord's Supper is a time to remember Jesus, to remember what He has done in us. All right. Have a great day. Enjoy communion. We'll talk next week.